Good morning. If you're visiting with us for the first time today, I would like to say welcome to Cornerstone Church. I am uh, Pastor Nathan. I am one of the pastors here at Cornerstone, and we're so grateful to have you as our guest today. Um, Right now, we're not really in a series, although these sermons have built off of one another. A couple weeks ago, I did a sermon uh, on my dog, uh, about my dog, uh, and and how God communicated to me his love for us through me and Sarah bringing in, rescuing this dog. Last week was probably one of the more uh, in-your-face, toe-stomping sermons that I've ever done, uh, talking about the seriousness of sin. And I'll be honest with you, I enjoy stepping on toes. I really do. Um, I was so excited to preach that message last week. Uh, even though it was a serious subject. This week, a serious subject as well. Um, last week, we, we talked a lot about willful sin or intentional sin. And just to give a quick recap, we were talking about, somebody took my Nerf gun. Where'd my Nerf gun go? Uh, Caleb's guilty. He's looking at me. Um, but we had a target. That Germex was the target. And we were talking about how sin is missing the mark, missing the target. And we were talking about how in, in our life, we are like that archer, or we have, a, we have a, a bow and arrow trying to hit that target, and when we miss that target, we are in sin. But there's a big difference between aiming at that target and missing and not even trying to hit that target and missing. This is unintentional if I try shooting it and miss. This is intentional if I'm trying to shoot somewhere else. And so we're, we talked about the seriousness of willful sin. And in fact, um, Scripture tells us in Hebrews that um, for those that uh, have knowledge of the truth and they still intentionally sin, there remains no sacrifice for those sins because they're not repenting. They're not even trying to aim in the right direction. We're going to talk about what the church's response should be to willful sin this week. And we're going to look specifically at a couple of passages here. Um, 1 Corinthians 5 is one of the places we'll park, and then there's a few other places that we're going to be pulling from. But um, we're going to look at what God's Word says, how w- the church should respond to willful sin. I think the church has a choice. We really don't have a choice because the Word of God is clear, but I think churches think they have a choice when someone willfully sins. The first thing that the church could do, and they should not do, is support that sin. Basically not calling it what it is. Actually encouraging people to live in sin. This is what's happening in some churches right now. When things were taught in scripture that were very clearly against scripture, and the church is saying, no, it's okay. Just continue to live that way. We're not calling sin what it is. And and the problem with that is that sin leads to death. And so when the church no longer calls sin what it is, then we are basically condemning that person to death, to eternal death. This is out of Romans chapter 1, and and this is not talking about necessarily the church. This is talking about a group of people that's living in sin. But I think this can be applied to churches who support people living in sin or support sinful lifestyles. It says this, Romans 1, 25, They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. These people, and I think these churches, had traded the truth about God for a lie, and they're worshiping their own desires. They're worshiping their sinful desires. They're worshiping um, themselves in many ways. And even in Romans 1.32, they know God's justice requires that those who do these things, those who live in sin, deserve to die. Yet they do them anyway. And worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. That's exactly what's happening in many churches. These churches are teaching false teachings and leading people to hell. So when we have a, a person, an individual living in willful sin, we can come alongside them and say, oh, that's who God created you to be. We can come alongside them and say, okay, just keep doing that. That's fine. God loves you anyway. Uh, He died for your sins. He'll cover every bit of that. But what's bad about that is we're just basically condemning them to death because they're going to continue living in sin. The second response is similar. We can just ignore it. 
If we know someone in the church is living in intentional sin and willful sin, some churches just ignore it. Pretend it's not even happening. See nothing, say nothing type thing. And even some churches and some pastors and some leaders, they know that someone's living in sin and they still say nothing to them about it. And this happens in more churches than you would think. This cannot be the right response. If the church is just pretending that willful sin is not happening, then we are essentially accepting it and allowing it. And because the church isn't calling it out and addressing it, it can lead to death and destruction without repentance. So to me, when, when as the pastor of this church and as a church leader, when I become aware of willful sin that's become a pattern, that's become a lifestyle, and this person claims to be a committed Christian, and especially a member of this church, I think the only choice is that we have to address willful sin. The church has to take sin seriously. We have to call sin what it is, knowing that it's going to lead to death if that person does not change. That's what really gets on my nerves about these churches that are essentially telling these people, just, just live how you want to live. Or they, they're aware of willful sin and not addressing it. They don't realize that they are leading people astray. That there are going to be people in hell because they are leading them there. And boy, I would, not, I would hate to be those pastors. I would hate to be those denominational leaders. I would hate to be any leader within those churches because they're going to be held responsible. I'm about to read that verse here. Pastors are held accountable. Church leaders are held accountable to God for how we do in watching over the souls of the people in our church. Hebrews 13, 17. The author of Hebrews says, Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls. And they are accountable to God. So I heard a pastor say a while back that he don't like asking other pastors, how many people go to your church on Sunday morning? He likes to ask, how many people are, how many souls are under your care? That has a lot more weight behind it than how many people go to your church on Sunday morning. We're held accountable to God. My job is to watch over your souls. And I'm held accountable to God on how I do with that. Do I hit the mark all the time? No. But I sure as I try as hard as I can to aim in the right direction. And he says here, give them reason to do it with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. That means bake your pastor as many cakes as you can. Make him as happy as possible. No, that's not what that means. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With you, with you, Sandy Jams, I'll just take Jams. Uh, give them reason to do it with joy, not with sorrow. That will certainly not be for your benefit. And then Peter talks about he compares pastoring to shepherding. First Peter five two through three. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So he compares pastoring to shepherding. And so this church, these people in, in my church would be my flock that God has put under my care. And my job is to watch over them, to watch over their souls. Now, if I was a shepherd and one of my, my sheep were, was heading for a cliff, it's going to fall off a cliff, should I just say, all right, bye, good luck? Or should I try to stop it? If I have someone in our church that is living in willful sin, heading off that cliff to their death, should I just pretend like nothing's happening? Or support them running in that direction? Or should I try to stop it? If someone is willfully sinning, they are hurting themselves. And others. Shouldn't the church address it? Absolutely. 
We address willful sin through a process called church discipline. I've never taught on church discipline before. I've never heard a sermon taught on church discipline before. But we're going to talk about church discipline today. Paul gave us an example of church discipline in 1 Corinthians 5. This is probably the most um, blatant example of church discipline in the Bible. Paul is getting on to the church in Corinth because they didn't address willful sin in their church. He says this, verses 1 and, and 2, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you, something that even pagans don't do. I am told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother, and you are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. So the church in Corinth has this man that is sleeping with his stepmother. And Paul is writing to the leaders in this church. He's writing to this church and he says, I can hardly believe this report. That this man is living in willful, open sin and the church is proud of it. The church is supporting him. So this church is taking route one, basically. They're supporting it. And some of them is doing route two. They're ignoring it. When Paul says, hey, you should be mourning in sorrow and shame. And he tells them they need to act by kicking this man out from the church. Today, let's talk about church discipline and what it means. It's not talked about very often. And unfortunately, let's say, I'd say this, it's not used very often. But it is part of the biblical mandate and it should be part of the church. In fact, uh, I looked up church, I, just, I think I typed in just church discipline on Google, and did you know that they have three marks in Protestant theology, basically of what, a, what makes an official church? Three things that a, a body of believers, that we would say a body of believers has to have in order to be officially recognized as, as the church, as a church. One of them would be preaching of the word. The second would be the recognition and administration of the sacraments, so that's baptism and communion. But you know what the third one was? Church discipline. And I was like, man, if you take that definition, church discipline is not uh, enacted in many churches nowadays, which would then take, that, take all those churches away from being classified as a church. We have a process of church discipline uh, in our, it's called the Westland Church Discipline, we have a process lined out in there for the disciplinary process on how it should be. I'm not really using much of that. I'm giving my personal definition and my understanding of it today. So here's my definition of what is church discipline. We're going to start with this. You, this is probably too much for you to write. Church discipline is the church's process of addressing sinful behavior and attempting to restore church members to holy living. Church discipline is the church's process of addressing sinful behavior, not ignoring it, not supporting it, addressing it, and attempting to restore church members to holy living. It is not about condemning that person. It is not about uh, knocking down that person. It is not about hurting that person. It is about restoring that person to live in the holy life, the path of peace that God has called us to live. So this is the process that a church would go through when a member of the church is living in willful sin. Now, let me get this out of the way. Every time a person sins, does there need to be this long, drawn-out process of church discipline? Not necessarily. It is when there's an intentional pattern of sin or a grave offense, then, the church, then church discipline needs to be done. Especially... When it is something that involves another church member or is brought up by another church member. Jesus himself was the one who instituted the idea of church discipline in Matthew chapter 18. This is verses 15 through 17. He gives us a process here, and we're going to cover this later too. But it says this, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. But if the person still refuses to listen, 
take your case to the church. This is when it gets into church discipline. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, which tells me there needs to be a process for how we make a decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. Basically, have nothing to do with them is what Jesus is saying there. Can you believe Jesus said that? That don't sound like love, does it? It actually is love, and we'll explain that later. But when someone's living in sin, and especially when they sin against you, Jesus said, go to them privately, talk between you two. If they do not repent, if they do not listen, then you bring two or three others with you, just so there's witnesses, so that person cannot lie and say, well, they never talked to me about it. They never talked to me. They never addressed it with me. They never told me I did something wrong. And if they still won't listen to the two or three witnesses that are with them, then you bring it to church, the church. And that is most often done and should be done through uh, letting leadership know of something going on. And then that's when the process of church discipline begins. Church discipline is exactly what it sounds like. Discipline brought on by the church to hopefully lead a person to correct their sinful behavior. Now, discipline can be defined as chastisement, correction, or instruction. It is centered around the idea of training someone to reach full development. It is not done to tear that person down. It is done to build that person up. Correction or chastisement does not need to happen unless there's something that needs to be corrected. And so when someone does something wrong, we go through this process of church discipline with the ultimate goal of training them to reach full development in their walk with Jesus. Last week we talked a little bit about the Lord's discipline. How when we do wrong, the Lord disciplines us. Hebrews 12, 5 through 6. Have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. And don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes each one he accepts as his child. Parents, if your child was in the wrong and they were doing something that you knew was going to lead to their death, aren't you going to discipline them? That's what God does with us. He disciplines us. And so church discipline is meant to come alongside and magnify the Lord's discipline. And there's a verse there, and Zach, if you can put back up verse 5, that I want to point out here. He says, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. There's an instruction there. And I think that instruction is there because I think we have the tendency to make light of the Lord's discipline. I think we have the tendency to shrug it off, to maybe think it's nothing major. And ultimately what we try to do is we try to ignore it. We try to numb it. We try to pretend that we don't feel that conviction from the Holy Spirit. We try to numb that pain away or we try to rationalize it away. We tend to try to shrug off the Lord's discipline. And so what happens is the Lord's discipline your soul. He's disciplined you in your mind, in your heart, and you feel the conviction from the Holy Spirit. And so when the church comes alongside of that and the church disciplines as well or dresses someone in sin, we are coming alongside the Lord's discipline and hopefully magnifying the Lord's discipline. Hopefully making sure that this person knows that they are in the wrong and that if they continue to do wrong, then they are going to end up in a place that they don't want to be. So even though someone may try ignoring the voice of God, when the church is practicing church discipline, we are magnifying that voice by following what God is leading us to do. God disciplines us because he loves us and he wants what is best for us. But it sure doesn't feel like love when it's happening. But ultimately, it's the most loving thing he could do. The author of Hebrews acknowledged that. He said, no discipline is enjoyable while it was happening. It's painful. But why is it the most loving thing that God could do? It's because if we respond correctly afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living that path of peace, walking that path of peace that he has called us to live for those who are trained. Notice this version uses the word trained, goes with discipline. Discipline is for the purpose of training. 
for those who are trained in this way. And so church discipline, just as the Lord's discipline, is always done in the spirit of love. It is not done to hurt someone. It is done ultimately to try to help that person to realize the seriousness of their sin and to repent. And it is lovingly done to protect other people in the church, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Later, I know when I have had to practice church discipline in the past, I think the devil tries playing with my mind. Are you really doing this in love? Or are you doing because this person's aggravating you? I hate dealing with conflict. And then I normally have to talk that through with some of my, my trusted advisors and they always go back to, what do you ultimately hope will happen in this situation? And I said, well, I hope they repent. I hope they change. I would love for them to come back to church. I would love for them to be part of our fellowship. And then they'll say, your heart's still in the right place then. That's the goal, is to bring someone back into a loving relationship with God and the church to lead that person to repentance. But I tell you what, in the middle of it sometimes, especially as a pastor when you're getting personal things said about you, when your leadership is being attacked, when your leadership is being uh, undermined, that's tough in the moment to not take it personal and then act out of those personal feelings. And I I think that's why pastors have to be emotionally healthy. If we're not emotionally healthy, we're going to act out of our emotions rather than out of the biblical mandate. So let's talk about the process. What is the actual process of church discipline? Well, it starts always with a conversation. And this is what Jesus said. This went along with what Jesus said. Starts with having a conversation with someone who is in sin. And when I have that conversation with someone, I'm looking for three things. Number one, is this person aware or unaware that they are in sin? I have talked to some people and they didn't even realize they were doing anything wrong. Is this person aware or unaware they are in sin? Number two, is this person sorrowful for their sin or are they proud? And then number three, are they repenting or not? Do they want to repent or not? And this, t- this, this conversation and determine those three things should happen at each level. And I'm not going to read all these verses again. But those conversations need to happen between the individuals in Matthew 18, 15. Between the two or three with the individual talking to the individual in sin. And then the church to the individual. Now that last part says if, the, if he still refuses to listen to your case, take it to your church. Take, it, take your case to the church. Now, this is similar to bringing, like, a case before a judge. And we throw this out all the time that we're not the judge other people. But I always have a problem with that, especially when Christians are saying that. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5.12, this is in that same passage, same chapter about church discipline. He said, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders. I'm not to judge non-Christians. I'm not to judge the people that don't even claim to be a Christian. But he says, it certainly is your responsibility. It certainly is the church's responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. We throw out that nobody can judge me but God, but right here, Paul makes clear, the word of God makes clear that we are certainly are. This is our responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. Now, is this judgment done to condemn them? I think that's what people often mean when they talk about judging. You're condemning me. No, that judgment is done in love to judge the situation, to judge the person I'm judging the person when I'm trying to figure out, are they aware or unaware? Are they sorrowful or are they proud? And are they repenting or not? I'm judging the person. I'm trying to figure out if they are truly trying to change or are they just going to continue living in sin. But that judgment's done to hopefully lead that person to repentance. I like to think about it like this. That conversation is taking the temperature of the situation. What's the indicators here? 
is this person, has this become a, a pattern of sin? We talked about last week how um, one sin can turn into two sins, which turns into four sins, which turns into eight sins, which turns into 16 sins, and all of a sudden you're way far from God when it all started with the one little sin that you didn't think was going to be that bad. Little sins turn into big sins, which turns into patterns of sins, which turns into lifestyle of sin. My job is to see, are they trying to get back? Are they trying to get closer to God? Are they content with going along the path that they're going? There's a path of peace and there's a path of destruction. Are they trying to walk the path of peace or are they willingly walking the path of destruction? Take the temperature, get the indicators, see what's going on. Now if the person is repenting, if we feel like that this conversation went well, that this person really is trying to change, then the next step in the church discipline process is restoration. Restoration. Restoration means that we restore a person or think about returning a person into a proper relationship with God and the church. There has to be a process of reuniting or restoring the person who is intentionally in sin. Because when someone is intentionally in sin and willfully sinning, sin separates. Sin creates chaos and destruction and pain all around. So when we are living in sin, we are separating ourselves from God. We are separating ourselves from others. And so there has to be a process of helping that distance between others and between God be um, taken away with and restore that person into a right relationship with God and others. And so Paul says in Galatians 6.1 that we need to do this gently. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. So we're to do this gently, we're to do this humbly with the goal to help that person get back on the right path. And getting that person back on the right path is best for the person and it's best for everyone involved, including the church. We do not want to see anyone leave. We don't want to see that. Sometimes that's the best thing to happen for the church, for the health of the church, but we don't want to see it. We'd rather see someone repent. And so we try to get everybody back on the right path, try to get everybody headed in the right direction, try to get everybody encouraging one another, pushing one another towards Jesus. That's our goal in church discipline. Practically, what does it look like when we're going through this restoration process? And I can't really tell you exactly what it looked like because each case is different but there's a general process number one we got to see if that person desires to see that sinful behavior in is their aim or desire in the right direction they have to stop trying to do whatever they are doing for us to be able to help them if that sheep that's heading for the cliff is constantly fighting me to still head to the cliff, I've got others that desire my attention. And so I'm not going to be able to stay with this one the whole time, and I'm eventually just going to have to let it go. And so we look to see, are they headed in the right direction, or are they even trying to head in the right direction? And then, and I think this is the church's purpose, and we don't really think about this, but Paul says in Galatians 6.1, he talks about those who are in sin, gently and humbly help that person back on the right path. And then in Galatians 6.2, he says, share each other's burdens. And in this way, obey the law of Christ. So part of your purpose at, as the church is to help restore a person. To, to the fellowship of believers help restore this person into fellowship with them and into fellowship with God. And so we who are Christians and we who are, are living, uh, aiming in the right direction, we come alongside them and we help them overcome their sin and correct their wrongs. And we help them lay the groundwork for sustainable, holy living in their life. It's not just about fixing the problem, putting a band-aid over the problem. It's about trying to prevent the problem from happening in the future. Right. Helping them build this foundation for them to build on in their life. Because I'm sure the sin that they were in has destroyed that foundation that they had already built. And eventually, after they go through this process where we're helping them alongside and we're helping them uh, grow, uh, eventually they are restored to full fellowship with the church. I did not include this in here, but when someone is living in willful sin, my conviction is that they don't need to be on this platform serving. 
they need to be, uh, really, they don't need to be serving much of anywhere. And because they need to focus on their own self. And so there's times where we tell people, you're not able to serve for right now until you, we see that you're repenting from your sin. And so when they go through the restoration process, then they restore them the full fellowship, then they can get back up and serve. I think that's important. I think that, um, I know churches that don't believe that. I know churches that will allow, uh, because they want a full band so bad, they'll let a, a, a bunch of people who are not living it outside of their life come up here and serve. And I'm like, what kind of example is this setting for the people in the church? I'm, I'm afraid people are going to say, well, if they let that person serve and let that person live that way, and that person is a church leader, if that person is up on the stage, then the church must be okay with drinking alcohol, getting drunk on alcohol on Saturday night. The church must be okay with having sex with everybody that you come in contact with. The church must be okay with sleeping around. The church must be okay with all this stuff. The church is not okay with it. And so we've got to be intentional about um, making sure that we are not leading other people astray by letting people serve in, especially positions of influence. And on the stage is a position of influence. Now here's what happens if they do not repent. Listen to me clearly here. This is the last resort. This is not what we want to do, but this is the last resort, and it's expulsion. You expel that person from, uh, from your fellowship. I guess I spelled that right. Jesus himself said this. I've already read it to you. I'm going to read it again. Matthew 18, 17. If he or she won't accept the church's decision, you treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. Have nothing to do with them. First Corinthians 5, 3, Paul's already said, kick this person out from your fellowship. Let's look what else he says. He says, even though I'm not with you in person, I am with you in the spirit. And as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man. In the name of the Lord Jesus, you must call a meeting of the church. And I will be present with you in spirit. And so with the power of our Lord Jesus, then you must throw this man out. And hand him over to Satan. So that his sinful nature will be destroyed. And he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns. Hand this person over to Satan. We're about to get into that. What does that mean? Titus 3.10. If people are causing divisions among you, give a first and a second warning. After that, after strike three, have nothing more to do with them that's tough especially i was thinking about paul saying calling a meeting of the church to talk about this person's willful sin boy we'd be accused of all types of gossiping if we did that nowadays yet it's a biblical mandate so this is specifically picking someone out of the church but i think this is also reasons for church discipline church discipline and expulsion sometimes has to happen for three reasons number one to lead the person in sin to repentance. That's what Paul meant there by saying, hand this man over to Satan. Throw this man out of the church, throw this man out of your fellowship, and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns. He's saying there, kick this person out, basically let that person hit rock bottom. Let that person live in their sin. Let that person know what it's like to continue down that path that leads to death and destruction. And hopefully before that person dies, their flesh will be killed. Their sinful nature will be killed. See, the church is real bad about giving people life jackets. Trying to keep them afloat. When they need to hit, yeah, safety net. When they, some people need to hit rock bottom before they realize that they need to give more of their life to God. Isn't that not very loving, you might be thinking? Actually, it's very loving. That person may feel hurt by the church. That first person may be hurt by the pastor. And often the pastor gets viewed as the bad guy. But you know what? I've come to the 
understanding and I've come to the conclusion that I would rather be viewed as the bad guy if it prevents someone else from continuing to be the bad guy. I would rather that person feel hurt by the church now than for them to hurt forever in hell. All of this, kicking them out, is ultimately done to lead them to repentance. And I'm going to tell you this, a lot of times you don't even have to kick them out. A lot of times they just leave. At least my experience. I've had to have one conversation with someone basically telling them um, that I don't think they were working out here. Um, previous ministry experience, we had another situation where we basically had to tell that person that they no longer could come. Um, they were making threats against me and the church, and um, so we basically told them they were not able to come anymore. But oftentimes the person just leaves. The heat gets too hot for them, and they just go on. But know that we don't kick them out just so we don't have to deal with that problem. We'll kick them out to hopefully humble them, hopefully so that sinful nature will be killed and so that they'll come to repentance. And by the way, this man that Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 5, he very well might have repented, based off 2 Corinthians 2. Sounds like Paul was instructing them to restore this man to their fellowship. And so this plan worked by Paul. Sometimes we need to stop throwing the life jackets out there and let them hit rock bottom, knowing good and well that the church, because we love them, we're going to be here for them when they return. Just like the prodigal son, the father was still there. The church is still going to be here. If they are truly repentant, yes, come on back in. Sometimes we've got to let them hit rock bottom before they repent. Number two, the second reason why you'd kick a person out is to protect the church. I've seen people say, pastors don't need to protect the church. God protects the church. Well, then why did Peter tell us that we need to watch over the flock under our care? If God's going to do all the protecting, then what am I doing here? Paul says here, same passage here, he says, your boasting about this sin is terrible. Don't you realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of that old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So he says that, that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. What he's saying there is that sin can be contagious. Yeah. Going back to my example about we are careful who we have on the platform. We're careful who we have serving in some of these high-profile positions. It's because if that, if that person is in sin and you know they're in sin, and you say, well, that person's up there doing this, and then the church must be okay with that, and all of a sudden you're in sin, and all of a sudden someone else is in sin, someone else is in sin, and it spreads like COVID-19. That was what I was thinking, the virus. If someone has the virus, are we going to want to be around that person and right next up to that person? No, we're going to tell that person, go quarantine. Go be by yourself. We do not want this virus to spread. We need to handle it and take it out before it spreads to other people someone looks up to you church every single one of you someone looks up to you and if you are living in sin that could lead someone else into sin and the person that looks up to them could be led into sin and then you have a whole batch of dough that is ruined that's not without stain that's not without blemish like god's church is supposed to be and so rather than letting a virus spread, we need to handle it and take it out. And in the church, sometimes, unfortunately, if that person will not repent of their sin, Paul says, remove that wicked person from among you. And this goes along with this, number three. Sometimes you kick a person out to set the example. This is in regards to elders who are in sin. So pastors, church leaders are in sin. 1 Timothy 5, 19 through 20. Paul tells Timothy, do not listen to an accusation against an elder unless it is confirmed by two or three witnesses. Those who sin should be reprimanded in front of the whole church. Why is that? 
because this will serve as a strong warning to others. Now, is Paul just saying in regards to elders there, or is he saying period? Different debates on it. I think there is argument for both. And I think if you take Paul saying call a meeting of the church, you would say that was public. I, I read one church's church discipline process, and what they do is they send a letter to the person that's living in sin and said, if you don't repent by June the 7th, we will be announcing your sin to the church. And that's why the, the response I got was wow from people I've told. But I said, it's biblical, though. But boy, we'd be the talk of the town about being gossips and all this stuff. I saw other situations, and I think I agree with this more. I have a good idea of who influences who in this church. And so if there's a person living in sin and they're not repenting, I'll tell the other people that this person looks up to. That, that, no, I'll tell the people that look up to this person. Just so that they know, hey, that was wrong. The people that was close to them do not follow in their footsteps. Set the example. We got to set the example for the church. It's a strong warning to others. We talked about the fear of God last week. Let's put the fear of God into people. Realizing the seriousness of sin, that we take sin so seriously in this church, unrepentant sin so seriously in this church, that we will kick the person out if they are not even trying to follow God. You know, I, I, I read through the book of Acts fairly often, and, and when I was completing my biblical studies degree, um, I studied the book of Acts as my final. And I always was fascinated with Acts chapter 5. Because in Acts chapter 5, we have a couple church members who lie to the church and lie to the Holy Spirit. Ananias and Sapphira. And they lied to Peter right to his face, one of the church leaders. And look at what happened here, Acts 5, 3 through 5. Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You have lied to the Holy Spirit and you have kept some of the money for yourself. Property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. And as soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about this was terrified. Basically, Ananias and Sapphira said, yeah, we're giving all the money that, from that sale to the church. And they're lying. They're keeping some of it back for themselves. And Ananias died. Sapphira kept the lie up. She died as well. It does not say God killed them. I don't think it says God killed them because I don't think he did. I think he, they just got the penalty they deserved. The penalty for sin is death. But you do notice what happened. They lied, they sinned, they died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Acts 5.11, great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. That is not the best church growth strategy. You would have thought God would have said, no, I want, this church, I want the church to grow. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to allow this person, I'm going to allow them to live. I think God allowed this to happen so that the church took sin seriously. I think God allowed this to happen so that this fear of living in sin, that this fear of um, what happens when you fall into the hands of the living God would strike the church and the church would take sin seriously. Today, kicking someone out of the church can sometimes be the hardest thing for that person. And it's hard on us, pastors, leaders, and it's hard on other members of the church. But when someone gets kicked out of the church, that lets people know how serious sin is and how serious the church takes sin, how serious God takes sin. And here's sin fear of living in sin fear of of uh of intentionally living in sin in our life but yet expulsion is not done lightly and like i said earlier often we don't even have to kick the person out they just leave 
but kicking a person out is part of the church disciplinary process if a person does not respond as they should. To end the message, I want to close with this point. And I just want to reiterate this, as I have multiple times throughout the sermon. The ultimate goal of church discipline is repentance. That is the goal. It's not punishment. It's repentance. It's not retribution. It's repentance. We want to see people change. We want to see, my job is to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And there comes a point sometimes, parable of the soils, there comes a point sometimes where you figure out someone's not good soil. When you have someone over here that is good soil. Sometimes you have to say, okay, I'm not spending time with this bad soil anymore. Some of the, the, the seed takes root, the gospel takes root, but something stops it from growing, and it just repeatedly keeps happening. But you've got good soil over here that's going to take in the gospel, take in the seed, and they're going to grow this plant, and it's going to, it's going to uh, mul multiply, multiply, more disciples, more disciples. comes to a point sometimes where you've got to leave the bad soil behind and focus on the good soil. But it's up to us whether we're going to be good soil or bad soil. Are we going to repent or not? Are we going to turn from our ways? Are we going to turn to God or not? Knowing that if a person does not repent and they continue down the path that leads to destruction, they are headed to hell, a real place where real people go and are punished for their sins. And it's not that God punishes them, it's that they get the penalty they deserve. And so I want you to know today, church discipline is one of the least favorite parts of my job, but a necessary part of my calling. I take my job seriously, and I do not want to see anyone living in sin, willful sin. And so I beg you today, just as I begged you last week, if you are living in willful sin, please repent. Please turn. And know that we are here to help. Often the church disciplinary process is a lot uglier when the person does not confess it, when we hear through the grapevine and then have to confront the person. There's going to be a lot more grace, a lot more mercy shown if the person confesses it because if the person's confessing their sin, I believe they're truly trying to repent. I believe that shows their heart. So if you're in sin today, I don't want you to fear having to go through church disciplinary process. But if you're in sin today, confess, knowing that we are here to help, and there is people in this church who are willing to help you. Confess your sins, seek help, live holy lives. And if you are ever being disciplined by the church or see someone else being disciplined by the church, Please know that it is done in love to ultimately lead to repentance.